When you hear the words anxiety, um, depression, abandonment, wow, they're getting harder, um, giving up, you just might not even want to go on another day. I wonder, do those emotions answer to what you're going through right now, what you're feeling? Um, John Callis is my next author, and he wrote a book called When the Rain Stops. And it's it's a powerful look at having gone through a journey of, well, a horrible journey as a child and coming out of it and finding joy and peace in adulthood. Um, John is an award-winning writer, director, producer. I mean, this guy has his own Wikipedia page. I don't think I need to say anything else. John, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Quite an introduction. (laughs) John, uh, I've read your whole book and it's intense. And I think that a lot of our audience can understand those feelings that you're talking about depression, abandonment, not wanting to go on. Why don't you start with what the overall message is of the book and how it came about? Well, uh, look, I don't think anyone gets out of life for free. Um, I think we all have our pains. We all have our personal problems and things. Um, this really started 10 days after my third birthday when my dad died. And at that point, I just hated God. I screamed all the time. I went into incredible fits of anger. I had dreams of falling into a spiraling thing where I would just wake up sweating. And it just continued from there. I, I became just unmanageable. Uh, my mother had three kids. She was pregnant with a fourth, miscarried at the funeral. And she... Um, she had no means of support. We were living in a, in a ghetto, basically. And it was tough. Every, every time I turned around, there was something else to remind me why I didn't have a father and what I was feeling. And kids would talk about, oh, I'm going to the baseball game with my dad this weekend. And I'd start making up stories about it um, because I didn't want to feel like the, the kid in the corner that had no dad. And um, by the time I got to fifth grade, uh, I, had, I was in love with my fifth grade teacher and she knew I would not concentrate. I'd be staring at the window. And one time she called on me to come to the blackboard and I had no idea what to answer. And she said, are you that stupid? And I ran out of the class. And it, you, know, you read that in the book, of course. Yeah. And that sent me into even more of a spiral. And from there, it just it, it went further down. John, it's not like your story is a kid who lost their dad at three years old and had full support from your mom. You were shipped off to military school at 12. At the age of 12, my mother was given a choice by the courts. Uh, I had gotten into a bit of trouble. And um, they said, either you send them to a military school or we're going to send them to juvenile delinquent uh, jail, basically. And so at 12 years old, my mother drove me uh, to New York City and put me on a train alone uh, to go to Virginia to a military academy. And to this day, I still have the image of watching the train pulling out of the station and seeing my mother get smaller and smaller and feeling uh, so abandoned, I felt like that was it. I wanted to jump off the train and just find a a box to sleep under or something. I was just scared out of my mind. I'm 12 years old. I had no idea what I was doing. And I I just, I wanted to be home, but it it just wasn't. It wasn't an option. It was not an option. One of the things you talk about, and I want to move into the healing and the finding joy part, but one of the things that really stuck with me was deep in your book, you talk about how loneliness and depression, you can live in a place that's horrible, but at least it's familiar and oddly safe. Yeah. That's it's, scary. It's scary. And to most people, they go, what are you talking about? How can, how can depressing places be safe? Well, you, you get so comfortable with your depression um, that it's a place that you hide in. And, and in there, you find some sort of solace, even though it's dark and ugly and lonely as hell. Um, it's yours. And, right. and you, you have something to hold on to. It's an anchor. And uh, it's a bad anchor to have. I have to tell you, it was not easy to break it. Let's move into that healing place. What was a turning point for you? Right around um, 10th grade, uh, we had a soccer coach that came to me and he said, are you going to play sports? And I said, I don't play sports. He says, well, didn't your dad ever teach anything? And I just sat there quiet. And he knew something was up. So he got it out of me. And he says, how about I teach you to play soccer? I <laughs> said, coach, I, I'm, you know, no, I can't. He, and he convinced me to come play soccer. And then from there, um, after a couple of years of soccer, I became the co-captain of the team. Um, I won varsity letters in ice hockey and wrestling. I was undefeated in the tri-state, tri-state area. 
And it started um, building a little bit of confidence in who I was. And then my math teacher came to me and he said, you know, I think you got a good mind for math. I said, what do you mean? He goes, I know you're having issues, but John, one and one is always going to be two. There's no, nobody that can tell you any differently. You don't have to be emotional about it. It's just fact, right? Well, nobody can argue your viewpoint. One and one will always be two. And so I became a straight A student in math because I just loved the fact that I had something that made sense to me and nobody could argue. Nobody could mess with me. Two and two is always four. I don't care how, unless you're Republican and two and two is six, (laughs) but okay, different issue. (laughs) Um, So that that really was. Literally, that's when the rain stopped because, you know, in your book. No, 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 that's not where the rain stopped. When did the rain stop? Because that's the name of your book. And what would you, what was the defining moment then? I think. Probably the defining moment is when I finally got to college and after a couple of stumbles, um, I started feeling like I had people around me that knew me, that, that were feeling like I can be part of something. And I think that's the beginning of it. But the real change is when I moved to Colorado. And when I got to the mountains of Colorado and I met people up there, I found a place. And by then I was into theater and I found the Third Eye Theater and I got an internship there. And this gal that took me to the mountains and introduced me to mountain living, helped me get a place. And that was, to me, that was the turning point because I I felt safe again. I felt like I could breathe. I was in the mountain. I mean, I was at an altitude of 8,600 feet or something below the base of a mountain called Mount Evans, which my cabin got 37 below zero because we didn't have heat. I chopped firewood in order to stay warm. But it was it was so cool. Everyone loved each other. The town was just filled with love. And I, I couldn't help myself. I just let go. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. How much of but a key I, how much of a key did that play in, in recovering? I think hundred percent. But it, it's not about only forgiving those who you feel did wrong, but you have to learn to forgive yourself. Mm-hmm. And um, people say very, how do you do that? What is a step to do that? Well, I think you have to do three things. You have to discover, you have to uncover, and then you have to recover. And I think for me, one of the ways of forgiving is I sat my mom down one night and she said, all right, I know you've always wanted to ask me questions. Let's talk. I'll answer anything, but it's too painful to talk about your father. So I will do anything I need to do to give you the information you want. And I brought up the night that, uh, or the day that she took me to the train station and she burst out crying. And uh, I'm about to cry too right now. Yeah, me too. And, um, and she said to me, I relive that day for the rest of my life. And I have nightmares about it. And we both just hugged each other and started crying. And from that moment on, wow. there was so much healing and uh, forgiveness. So an honest, an honest talk with maybe someone that, that's the root or the anchor of your pain. Those small steps you talk about, and we have to kind of begin to wrap up here, but share just a little about how important it's not going to all happen with that one gigantic step. Those small steps are very significant. Baby steps. you got to take a baby step. You, it's like trying to quit smoking or something. You can't just do it. You have to do baby steps. So forgiveness is a, it's a powerful tool, but you really have to look inside yourself and make the decision that you want to have your, your life better for you, not for anyone else. And once you make that decision, you realize that the eyes that you see life through, like a lens, probably why I like directing so much, is all about what you're putting in front of your lens. So your life is yours and the quality of it is because of you and nobody else. If people want to know more about me, I have a website. That's www.johncallis.com. The book, you want to see it? I do. Uh, this is the cover. You, oh. Excuse the band across it. That's that's because I did a proof. Uh, there we go. Very nice. That's a very eye-catching cover. Thank you. John, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story and being so real and vulnerable and um, for giving us hope that there's life after abuse and abandonment. We we We... We love you. We appreciate you. I love you too. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on.